Sorry, just for a minute. Bear with me. Good morning, everyone. I um, just want us to continue standing as I pray and then as I read our passage for this morning. So let's pray. Father, we are so thankful to be here today in your presence, both in body and in spirit. We are overwhelmed with the love, grace, and forgiveness that you have given us. May your word illuminate you so that people would look to you and seek your face. And that as we grow together, we can continue to see how beautiful you are. In Jesus' name, amen. And our passage today is Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 to 39. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. We just also uh, welcome anyone new today. Give them a warm welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hope you fed well this morning. So we're still going through our series this month called The King's Way. And I titled my message this morning, The King's Lament. Can we get a gain down on this microphone, please? Because so kings, the king's lament. Because uh, in your Bible, if you have those little headings on certain passages, this passage is titled with something that says, Lament over Jerusalem or the lament, the lament of Christ. The key here that I want you to pick up on is that this set of verses contains the gospel, both sides of it. We have the good news, and we have some bad news that makes the good news good. Recently, I saw part of an interview uh, of a, a musician on a YouTube short. So I'm not going to say who, because they were taken drastically out of context, but he talked about what he thought was wrong in, with the church today. And what he said was that we don't understand who Jesus was historically. And he was talking about it in a certain way because he gets condemnation and, and re, rebuke put upon him. Uh, what he said was Jesus only had relationship with sinners. Okay, that tracks. He then went on to say that Jesus rolled with 12 thugs and that if he was here today, he would be riding a Harley and going to bars. <laughs> okay. Well, I heard that and you know, I thought he's probably not entirely wrong. But he's also not quite right because what we're missing is why would Jesus be going to bars? When you read the Gospels, it never seems like Jesus is hanging out with sinners just to have a good time and kick back, and like, let's just relax. And so, the verses that the musician used, he doesn't quote them, but he alludes to the woman caught in adultery, who's about to be stoned. And Jesus famously says, let he who has not sinned cast the first stone. And that's where the guy stops, and he leaves off, go and sin no more. See, the gospel is both rebuking of your sin and accepting Jesus' forgiveness. We have two sides, and I think we can get in this balancing act where we lean in on the rebuking and say, it's about go and sin no more. I have to tell people to stop sinning. Stop sinning. Or we lean on the forgiveness side, and we think it's just, then I condemn you neither. But Jesus, if he is taking in the 
proper context with what he says will not allow that to happen. And that's what I love about this passage. It captures both sides of Christ. It has his righteous judgment and his eternal capacity to forgive. A little background on these verses. So when Jesus is saying this, it's likely still Palm Sunday after he's entered Jerusalem. It doesn't seem like much time has passed. Crowds are cheering for him, and, and this leads the religious leadership to confront him with questions. And Jesus responds to them. And that goes directly into Jesus delivering seven woes to the scribes and Pharisees. That's all of chapter 23 until we get to this, these verses. And if you want a good read, I recommend the rest of chapter 23 because Jesus just goes after them. Like he is condemning them in a way that says, you will be wrought with judgment and pain and fear because you have led the people astray. Your focus on your own righteousness and looking good has caused you to clean the outside of the cup but leave the inside filthy. And the last one is about how they have incurred the guilt of the blood of the prophets that have been sent. And then immediately after this, we see in chapter 24, as Jesus and his disciples are leaving, he tells his disciples, that the temple will be destroyed. Now, these details, I think, sometimes get lost in 2,000 years of cultural change. But when Jesus is going to the religious leaders, he is going to the people that you would look to and say, that is who I need to emulate. If I want a relationship with God, if I want to please the Almighty, that's who I need to be like. And Jesus is coming up and saying, They are not who you need to be like. They are not who you need to be looking to because inside they are also filthy and need redemption. They haven't made it. And the temple, the temple, you can't can't think of it like a church. That would be a synagogue. Um, The temple is the place where God dwells. It's the only place where you can get true communion with God. It's the only place where you can go and know that he's there. And Jesus walks out and says, this temple is coming down. He's saying, you will not have a path to God. God is leaving. Which is what happens in Ezekiel. Ezekiel gets a vision of God literally leaving the temple. That's something that has great impact. It's saying, you will be lost, and you are currently lost. So, with that background and and context I want to read that passage again. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So, this text shines light on one attribute of us and two attributes of God. The attribute of us is the wickedness of Jerusalem. The first part of verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. These are God's chosen people. They have received the promise that God will bring joy to the world through them. These are the people that God has chosen to represent him. And throughout history, they represent him poorly. And so he sends people in his name to say, you are in the wrong again. Come back this way. You're missing the mark. Come back to the Lord. And what is the response of these people? Many times, to kill and stone God's messengers. This is a heavy, heavy rebuke from Jesus. And soon, just a few days from these verses, these people are about to kill the ultimate messenger, God coming down himself in the flesh. 
Do you understand that? That he has been sending people to say, this is what I want to tell my people. And finally he says, I will come down. I will steer you back to me. And what do these chosen people do again? Same thing. And the same thing that you and I do when we deny him. So I want you to see your own wickedness in this. I'm not saying that you've killed prophets, but don't overlook your own faults. That you sit beneath a holy, perfect, loving, just, almighty God, and that you cannot stand there on your own merits. So often we turn our back on him for our own desires. So often we, who have also been chosen, say, I will look away. It's the same exact thing with a little bit less physical violence. So there's the wickedness of Jerusalem. And the first attribute of God that this shows is the forgiveness of God. The second half of verse 37, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. Do you ever think that you have fallen beyond the forgiveness of God? That what you have done cannot be justified by the blood of Christ? Who do you think you are that in your human form you could sin in a way that could outpower Jesus? You could outpower the perfect holy blood of our Savior. So even those people who killed and stoned prophets were longed for by God. He's calling them out and saying, you have done atrocious things. But I will, what I want to do is gather you as a hen would gather her chicks. Let me protect and shield you, but you're not willing. And so you have to be willing to take refuge under his wings. That comes with a cost. And thank you to, for my helpers today. Okay. Demonstrating. If you were a baby chick and you wanted to take refuge under the mother hen, guess what? You don't get to decide where you're going. Because if you walk away on your own, you will leave the protection of the hen. And should have another image just to help some more to, uh, to visualize that. And so God says, come to me. And that is what we are all called to do. But coming to him comes with the cost of some independence and saying, I will depend on you, God. I will look to you for my security. So this begs the question, what is he shielding you from? He's shielding you from his justice. There's a preacher named Paul Washer and I'll give you his name because I'm not taking him out of context. Um, and he has this great visual that stuck with me that God with his two hands, with one hand he's holding back his judgment on the earth and with the other he's calling to you, beckoning for you. But one day both of those hands will drop. Will you come to his call? Will you answer it? And that brings us to the second attribute of God in this passage, which is his justice, his right judgment. Verses 38 and 39. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He's saying, I will leave the temple desolate, which means with nobody. This is where God is dwelling. It's God's house. And he brilliantly says, I will leave your house. Your house is left desolate. He's giving it back to them and also saying, I'm going to leave. This isn't an idle threat. He is going to leave them. But in the grace of God, he always gives away. What Jesus does not give is a second option. 
He does not say, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, or you take over a ministry, or you give this much money to the church, or you help this many elderly elderly ladies cross the street. He does not say that whatever it is, he does not call out any work that you can do to see him. As Damien touched on, he says you have to call out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And actually, here Jesus is quoting Psalm 118. So we're going to go there now. Um, Psalm 118 is, in my opinion, one of the top psalms, um, one of the yeah, top ten to be familiar with. It's a rock star psalm of prophesying Jesus the Messiah. And honestly, you probably know more than you think. Um, verse 1, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Verse 6, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? I've seen that on coffee mugs. Uh, Verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That's a huge prophecy of Jesus. And verse 24, if you could help me with this, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be... Yeah. Do you guys know Psalm 118? So... We're starting in verse 25. We've got verse 25 and verse 26. This is what Jesus is referencing back to. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Did you know that ancient Hebrew Hebrew writers didn't really have the ability to bold their text? They didn't have exclamation points. So if they wanted to drive something home, they repeated it. That's what we see in verse 25. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray. This is a Jewish version of saying we are really praying. This praying isn't like saying grace before you eat your food. The word here for pray also means plead in Hebrew. So when the psalmist says, save us, Save us, we plead, O Lord. It's because they can't save themselves. They've been trying. They're saying, you have to come save us. O Lord, we're pleading for you to give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're predicting that the Messiah will come and save them. So here's a really cool thing. The four words, save us, we pray. In Hebrew, it's two words. Yasha Anna. So we could say, Yasha Anna, O Lord. And if you say it quick enough, you'll find the Greek transliteration, Hosanna. This is where we get the word Hosanna. Yasha, Yasha Anna, Hosanna. Now, I want to read that again, and maybe you'll recognize this. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the triumphal entry. This is what people are shouting as Jesus enters Jerusalem. So we're going back to Matthew chapter 21. Verse 9. And the crowds that went before him. Um, these, these are people who have followed Jesus from the Sea of Galilee. He's probably picked up some others along the way, along the Jordan River. But essentially, they've been coming from the north. Okay, And it says... The crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, kids, if you're paying attention, I've got a prize up for grabs. Can any of the kids tell me what were the people laying down on the road in front of Jesus as he was entering Jerusalem? Yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. Well done, Olivia. That's right. (laughs) 
So, Hosanna, save us as he enters Jerusalem. Save us, O Lord. Here's the kicker. It's possible that some of those people, five days later, went from shouting, Hosanna, save us, to crucify him. And if they had, what, what does that say about their expectations? They were expecting a conquering king to come into Jerusalem and overthrow Rome. He's going to build an army. They're calling out, save us from Rome. So maybe some of these people showed up with that expectation of how God was going to save them. And instead of raising an army, Jesus continues to preach about sin and redemption. Jesus didn't come to overthrow Rome, but to take their sin upon himself and redeem them. How often have we cried out to Christ to save us and then betrayed him when it wasn't what we wanted? We've all been there where we, you say, Lord, I need you to do this for me. And he does something else. Do you abandon him then? Or can you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, regardless of how he comes? Because I trust in he who comes in the name of the Lord. I want to read our main passage again. I just want you to hear Jesus cry, his sadness over Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What are our practical takeaways from this passage? This is what I hope you take home today. Number one, regardless of who you are or what you've done, God longs to shield and protect you. He is calling to you, and not just to you, not just to everyone in this room, or those listening later, but to every person on earth. He's calling them to him, gathering his chicks. Number two, judgment will come. Because God is just. And I don't mean that in a, the way we typically do, where we say that person is just because he acts in a just way. God is just in a way that we can define justice because of who he is. He is justice. And so justice will come, which should give you joy because you have all been wronged. Every one of you has been hurt and attacked, and every one of those things will be paid for because God cannot let the guilty go unpunished. But then at the same time, it should give you some fear because you have also dirtied this creation. You have hurt people intentionally and unintentionally, and God will by no means let the guilty go unpunished. But Jesus does not give options. He gives himself. He gave himself entirely so that you could stand rightly in the justice of God because you could not without his shield. Number three, to see and know Christ, you have to be willing to shout, save me, knowing that you cannot save yourself. You have to be able to shout, blessed is he, who comes in the name of the Lord regardless of how that actually looks in your life. Uh, bonus number four, I want you to notice that even in the midst of the week of his execution, Jesus is looking to these people, knowing that he's about to go to the cross, knowing that he's about to go through hell, figuratively and literally. Knowing that's coming, he calls for the judgment of his persecutor, not with gloating, not with you will get yours, but with lament. Sorrowful that he cannot save these people that he has been calling because they will not come to him. 
The last verse I want us to look at this morning is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. <laughs> the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. In those times of suffering, when you say, how could God allow this? How could God, who loves mercy and justice, allow this to happen? Know that he is not holding back through indifference. He's holding back because he is lamenting those who don't know him. He's holding himself back with one hand, and he's reaching out with the other, beckoning people to come to him. Will you come? Will you bring others with you? This is the whole gospel. It's not what that musician said, that Jesus just forgives, so just live how you want. And it's not what the Pharisees said, there is no forgiveness if you don't follow all these laws. There's a balance there. Because it is bad news for us. That is followed by the ultimate good news. And if you are taking notes, you can write these following verses down. These are great memory verses that I feel describe the gospel really well. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 talks about the premises that we find ourselves in. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So you take that to its logical conclusion and you say, okay. I cannot stand with God because I have sinned. I've missed the mark of his holiness. So what? Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin, what is earned from sin is death. And it's not talking about a physical death, but an eternal death. Separation from the one and only God, creator of love and hope and joy. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So you think, okay, I've, so I've sinned. My sin separates me from God. He has given me a way back. How do I get there? John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus gave his life for you. I'm going to have the band up again. Thank you. Uh, I did karate for many years. I know some moves. Um, But I know how easy it is when someone says, look, says you, to look over and say, he means them. And I did that all the time. And, like, you aren't moving your foot properly. You aren't throwing your punch the right way. And I'd go, that guy. But there's a tough part with this platform. Because on this platform, my job is to take text that is at most recent 2,000 years old and convey it in a way that you can take it in. So to stop you from saying, he means them, I'm going to turn this back on me. Put it on the record like Damien. Because I want you all to look at me and know that I deserve hell. What I have done in my life is giving me nothing but the eternal judgment of God. And that is right. That is good. It doesn't matter that I occasionally get to come up here and preach his word. It doesn't matter that I lead the youth group. It doesn't matter because what I've done, my wages have earned me eternal death. But I stand before you underneath the wings of Christ, under his presence, under his protection and salvation, and say it is by nothing that I have done except cry out, save me, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And maybe you're here and you've never cried out to Jesus to save you. But you sense something calling you now. It's God holding back his judgment and reaching out to you with his love. If you desire to turn away from your wrongdoing and to turn to Jesus, to believe and call on his name, he will save you. If that's you, and you want to commit your life to following Jesus, or if you want to recommit your life, while no one else is watching, just put up your hand right now. Respond to Jesus. for your word today, for speaking to us. We thank you that you were just, that you were good, that you were also loving, and you have made a way for us to come back to you, into relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for us and for raising back to life so that we have a hope in you, a hope in your power, a hope of eternity with you, in relationship with you, God. Lord, just go with us into this week as we interact with other people. Would you shine through us your love, your grace, that people can see Jesus and come to him. Thank you, God. Amen.